Hello, movie lovers. Today I want to talk about a 1967 English film called Privilege. And um, this is directed by Peter Watkins. It stars Paul Jones uh, and Gene Shrimpton. And although filmed in 1967, it's kind of a dystopian movie. It's set in 1970, so the near future kind of dystopia. And it's about the manipulation of society by the corporate, the state, the church, um, and using a pop star, a pop star with uh, uh, popularity akin to the Beatles. Uh, but this is a lot different kind of pop star than the Beatles. Uh, there's, uh, uh, they use a stage of violence. These, these uh, authoritarian masters believe that they need to have this, that the that public, especially teenagers, need to have this vicarious uh, relationship with violence so that they won't be violent in real life. At least that's the theory. And uh, in 1967, there, there was not, you know, I don't think there were stage performers yet. Of course, that was to come, and it's part of the prescience uh, of, uh, of privilege. And it's, it plays, though, on the, on the, on, on, on the Beatles' popularity so that when we see the stage shows, um, the girls, we see images that you saw from the Ed Sullivan show and other shows where the Beatles would appear on television and they would be crying and they looking up with such adoration uh, towards, their, um, towards their idols. But this is, again, very different than the Beatles because the Beatles were fun. You know, we, we see in Privilege, we see this uh, rock star played by Paul Jones, um, you know, mob, he gets a ticker tape parade, mobs everywhere. He's become a, a corporate entity. There's discos and, and movie theaters and um, all with his name. Um, and there, and he's being used, and you know, he, and he knows he's being used to help manipulate the public into, into conforming. Um, and uh, uh, and it, it's and that conforming that 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 the message of conformity is part, I think, of the discordant uh, elements in the film, in that they they use conform, 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 where I, I don't think you get. Yeah, I don't think that's a really good way to uh, manipulate uh, people. It's probably because people want to believe. They don't want to think they're conforming. They, they want to believe that, they're, that uh, they have something they've found, that they, a leader that they can um, uh, build a cult around and cherish and uh, an ideology that they can share with other like-minded people. And there's also Peter Watkins is using this very much a documentary approach. And he was a documentarian, and he uses this approach in, 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 in many of his other movies, none of which I've seen. Uh, but then we have intimate scenes to, to go along with this, uh, and where it wouldn't be part of a documentary. In other words, we have a narration, a narrator, and people are looking uh, into the camera and talking about, um, about the, um, uh, this pop star and... and, and how they're handling him, and um, and they and these and the handlers in the corporate world and the in the religious world uh, uh, that is uh, surrounds uh, this pop star is uh, performed by professional actors who are giving accurately performances of of, of some uh, merit. They 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 bring some life into the film, but in the two major uh, 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 roles in the film, Paul Jones, Gene Shrimpton. Uh, they're not professional actors, and and what and they're they're not very expressive. So we see glum, we see not so glum, very glum, um, and and like I say, they have intimate scenes, and I don't know how much that is due to the um, their inexpressiveness is due to what the director Peter Watkins wanted, or these these are two performers that were uncomfortable being actors and uh, in, in performing. Paul Jones was the lead singer of Man for Man up to 1966, Do Wah Diddy, one of their big hits in the U.S. Um, and after 66, he goes out on his own. Um, and he did he does do other acting in his career, never became a significant movie star, 
uh, and in reading some of his bio, he did appear in a lot of stage, musical stage productions. Gene Shrimpton was the first supermodel of all, of all time. She sort of created the supermodel look and it's kind of hard to get, get her look on, on my phone, but she had the look and she was the supermodel of the early 1960s. And I was a teenager, and I was absolutely mesmerized by uh, uh, by Jean Shrimpton. And um, and uh, so, you know, even though she's inexpressive as an actress, she's really giving <laughs> giving an effort. And I I could never tire of uh, my admiration for the beauty of Jean Shrimpton. You know, whether she's a good actress or not is kind of uh, transcended <laughs> by by uh, other interests and, and, and especially her beauty. And she had that kind of beauty where she didn't seem to be aware that she was, she was so beautiful. It was probably, uh, pro probably mo mostly in the eyes, which were so well photographed. Um, but uh, ne nevertheless, you know, there is this, uh, um, there, there is this discord in between all these terrific actors on the, on the, uh, on, on the edges and on the sidelines, and, and then we have two non-professional actors. Um, and I have to mention too, the cinematography is terrific. And Peter Shudzitsky, um, this is maybe his second feature film, but he has had a terrific career, and uh, he's he's filmed uh, for many uh, terrific directors, and including David Cronenberg from Dead Ringers, which is about. I guess it's sometime in the 80s. All, I think, all of David Cronenberg's movies since Dead Ringers in 85 was, were photographed by Peter Shusinski. And, and uh, Privilege looks great. I mean, it's, it, it's an absolutely uh, uh, beautiful looking film. And there's uh, some very, very interesting sequences. Uh, there's a long handheld uh, shot as he follows the two actors for, for quite a while. Um, and... Um, and then we have a final sequence because obviously Peter Watkins is, this is sort of like a warning, you know, <laughs> of what can, what can come with all this belief in the nation nationalism. Uh, we, unfortunately, in the day I'm shooting this video, we have a manifestation of where ultra nationalism can, can lead us in the, in the news. And, um, and also with the, uh, um, with the, the church and Christianity becoming part of the um, politicized. When I was brought up in a fundamentalist church in the 1960s, and evangelical fundamentalist, and and politics was taboo. There was no political <laughs> ideology being uh, formulated, and and now, of course, all those churches and most of them are heavily aligned both with the. Uh, uh, with the Republican Party, uh, capitalism itself, nationalism, it is, his privilege is, is being prescient and, and certainly in the United States in that way. Um, and then um, we get a, uh, uh, a, a commentary by Daniel Kramer, and it's very good, you know, he's always good, he, he really likes Peter Watkins' films. And there's no doubt of that. And uh, Punishment Park has recently been uh, released by Indicator. Um, this is the first and only film I've ever seen by Peter Watkins, and I didn't see any of his films at the, at the time. And um, and and uh, the he goes over the critical uh, response to it. This was not. This was a major studio. The only time that Peter Watkins ever was able to um, make a film for a, or was interested, I guess, maybe, to make a film for a, a major a studio. Uh, but J. Arthur Rank in, 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 in uh, England, is, he barely released the film. I do remember it playing in the United States, so it certainly did get a release here. The, he quotes uh, most of the commentators, did not, the reviewers of the Times, uh, the different newspaper reviewers, uh, they disliked it, some absolutely hated it, but I did come across some positive ones. One of them was from Roger Ebert. In 1967, he was just starting out. That was the first year of his, um, of his tenure as a, as a newspaper reviewer, of course, far before he became famous for his television appearances. 
but he gave it three and a half stars in, in a rave review in which he said, um, because uh, Peter Watkins' previous film, War Game, had, it, had attracted a lot of attention as anti-war stance. And Roger Ebert uh, predicted that uh, Peter Watkins would go on to become, you know, um, comparable to uh, Fellini and, and Bergman. He was, he was that important. Of course, that never happened. You can't blame Roger Ebert for, in, in his enthusiasm uh, and in his first year of reviewing uh, for latching on to somebody whose movies uh, were meaning a lot to him. But overall, for me, it's a very interesting film as far as a, as a historical artifact for its presence and ongoing presence of, uh, you know, over 50 years later, we're seeing so much of what um, Peter Watkins was, uh, was uh, um, talking about and in, in, in warning us against in 1967. Um, so it, I found it interesting in that regard, even if I did find it a bit uh, dramatically unsatisfying. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody who managed to listen to me. I do appreciate it. Comments are welcome. You guys take care.